Hello, everybody. Welcome back. All President's Day. But today is All Viruses Day. Every day is All Viruses Day. And today is a very interesting topic. One of my favorites, reverse transcription and integration. And you have to read the quote. I will read it to you. Every slide has a quote, right? You probably didn't even notice. But this one is so cool because you're going to see it, it applies to this lecture. One can't believe in impossible things, says Alice. I dare say you haven't had much practice, said the queen. Why, sometimes I've believed as many as six impossible things before breakfast. I don't know who's read Alice in Wonderland. Okay, so that's what today is about, more than six impossible things. It's very cool. So this starts with some history. 1908, a chicken leukemia virus was discovered. In other words, a cell-free filtrate, you put it through a 0.2 micron filter, you inject it into chickens, it causes leukemia. We'll get back to that when we talk about cancer, what's going on there. Three years later, Rouse here in New York City discovers a, a virus that causes a solid tumor, a sarcoma, for which he got the Nobel Prize 55 years later. People didn't think at the time leukemia was a cancer. That's why those other individuals didn't get much credit. But these were eventually called tumor viruses because when you inject them into animals, they cause tumors. And then they were found to have RNA genomes. So they are RNA tumor viruses. Now, Howard Temin was working on this uh, in the, uh, what year? Late 50s. He made the, the logic that when you infect cells in culture with these RNA tumor viruses, they get their morphology changes, they get transformed permanently. And he said that somehow this RNA virus must be making a DNA copy and that gets integrated into the cell genome. And he called this the provirus hypothesis. And then uh, David Baltimore, who, had, who made the Baltimore scheme, you remember, he came at it from a different logic. He said, okay, RNA viruses with plus-stranded genomes don't need a polymerase in the particle because they can be translated as soon as they get into cells. Minus-strand RNA viruses have to have a polymerase in the particle. So he said, okay, if Temin is right, then there must be an enzyme in the particle to convert RNA to DNA because they thought that such an enzyme did not exist. They're actually wrong, but their logic turned out to lead them in the right direction. They both published papers back to back in uh, the early 70s. They independently discovered this enzyme in vi RNA tumor viruses. And it was called reverse transcriptase. And there are two separate papers here, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase and virions of Rouse sarcoma virus. That was the one discovered in 1911. And then uh, Baltimore, RNA-dependent DNA polymerase and virions of RNA tumor viruses. He used a different virus. Uh, just parenthetically, uh, at the 50th anniversary of this discovery of RT, I did a podcast at Cold Spring Harbor with um, David Baltimore and a few other people. Unfortunately, Howard Temin uh, died some time ago. And he said he, he thought of this idea, and in two weeks he did all the experiments. He wrote up the paper. And Temin had been working on this for 10 years, so he felt sorry for him, so he called him up, say, Howard, I'm gonna publish this. And so Howard rushed to finish the experiments and they got back-to-back -back publications. So he said that was the right thing to do. So remember that if you do some science, be nice. Mm -hmm. I know you need to get ahead, but maybe you can call your competitor and do something. So the enzyme that plays a big part in today's talk is reverse transcriptase because we used to think genetic information goes RNA, DNA, protein. And this one obviously goes RNA, DNA, and then DNA, RNA, protein. So it kind of reverses it. So they called it reverse transcriptase. It has completely revolutionized molecular biology in ways you can't even imagine. Every assay uses it. Whenever you have an RT-PCR for anything, including SARS-CoV-2, you first take RNA and convert the DNA with reverse transcriptase, then you do a PCR reaction. PCR also revolutionized molecular biology. 
but this too, and you can buy it now. You can buy tubes of reverse transcriptase, you see, it's called Superscript 3. You know, so if you want to go into marketing, you can make up clever names like that. You have to fool scientists to buy it. Because I guess you can't call it reverse transcriptase because then everybody would call it the same name and the lawyers don't like that. So we're at the beholden of the lawyers. That's the way life is. So every uh, diagnostic test, but also in research, we amplify genes using reverse transcriptase. We do so many things with it. So here on the Baltimore scheme, fittingly, is where the retroviruses sit. They have RNA genomes of positive polarity. But as you'll see today, they are not translated when they infect cells. They are copied to a DNA copy, first single-stranded <coughs> first single DNA and then double-stranded DNA. I can't find my pox bottle. I think I left it here. Did you take it? Please return it. I need those pox viruses. Darn, I don't know what I did with it. And we're gonna talk about that uh, step here, the conversion to DNA. Uh, and then the DNA, of course, would give rise to mRNA, but the, that DNA first has to integrate into the host cell. It's an obligatory step for retroviruses, integration into the host cell. So Ryle sarcoma virus, one of those first RNA tumor viruses discovered is shown here. It is an enveloped virus with glycoproteins in the envelope. We call this, we call these SU and TM, surface and TM parts of the envelope. Then there is a icosahedral capsid within it, which contains the viral plus stranded RNA. And there are two copies of the RNA for reasons I'll explain in a moment. And they're coated with a protein called nucleocapsid protein. So this is very unusual for a, a plus stranded RNA virus to have protein coating it, but that's because uh, reverse transcription is going to happen when this infects the cell. And in this virus particle, you can see there is reverse transcriptase. There's also a molecule called integrase uh, and a protease and some other things as well, which we'll explore uh, today. And so this at the top is the genome of the virus as DNA. So a term you're gonna need to remember is provirus or proviral DNA. That means the integrated DNA copy of the retrovirus genome. Right? So you go from RNA to DNA, and that double-stranded DNA, when it's integrated into the cell, it's called the provirus, after Howard Temin's hypothesis. So you can see the provirus is flanked by two sequences called LTR. Those are long terminal repeats. They will figure prominently today. All of you have thousands of LTRs in your genome. That's what you're looking at here. You have them all, no exception. So does every animal on the planet. And we'll talk about that later. But the simplest retroviruses encode three proteins, gag, pol, envelope. So the gag is the structural proteins that make up the capsid. The pol is the polymerase, the reverse transcriptase, and the integrase, and then the envelope protein. And this DNA, of course, is transcribed to form an mRNA that's capped and polyadenylated, which is then translated uh, to form viral proteins. When these viruses infect the cell, here's the overview, and then we'll go into some detail. Virus binds to a receptor. Many of them fuse at the plasma membrane and dump the capsid into the cell, the nucleocapsid, right? The icosahedral shell with the genome in it, that goes into the cytosol and the genome never leaves, kind of like real viruses. The genome never leaves the capsid. There's, of course, reverse transcriptase in there, and that converts the RNA into a single, double-stranded circular DNA molecule. And then that, sorry, not circular. It's shown here as circular, but it's actually linear, sorry. So the RT converts it to a double-stranded linear molecule that goes into the nucleus and integrates into the host cell chromosome. Now we call it a provirus. And from there, mRNAs are made, which give rise to proteins uh, that lead to the production of new particles. We'll talk about the assembly of these next time. It gets a lecture all uh, on its own. Now the enzyme reverse transcriptase, here are a few properties. The primer, it's a primer dependent enzyme. It can be DNA or RNA. The template can be DNA or RNA. And you say, why is that? Well, to go from RNA to single-stranded DNA, the template is single-stranded DNA. 
But then you have to take that single-stranded DNA, make it double-stranded, and the reverse transcriptase does that as well. So the template can be RNA or DNA, but always DNTPs, not RNTPs are incorporated. Deoxynucleotide triphosphate, which are the precursors of DNA, are incorporated. Never the precursors of RNA, RNTPs. And the enzyme is very much like all of the other uh, enzymes that we've talked about, which uh, add, add material in a five to three prime direction and read the template in a three to five prime direction. Now, it turns out that contrary to Baltimore and Tamin, everything has RT on the planet. Bacteria, archaea, eukaryotes, us, our cells have reverse transcriptase activity. They just didn't know it. But it worked for them because it turns out the virus has its own RT in the capsid. It does not utilize cellular RT. And here's a tree of life, of course, showing you how the bacteria, the archaea, and the eukaryotes evolved from a common uh, ancestor. And so because all three domains of life have RT, it must have evolved in the last ancestor uh, of all of them, simpler than having it evolve independently. And in fact, the phylogenetic analysis, comparison of RT sequences from bacteria, archaea, and eukaryotes say that it came from a single precursor. It's very old, in other words. And we think it might be the bridge between the RNA world and the DNA world. Remember, we think there was an RNA world existing before cells. And somehow that gave rise to a DNA world. How did that happen? Well, a lot of things had to happen, like protein synthesis, but cells require DNA genomes. There are no cells that we know of that have RNA genomes because they can't get long enough. And so at some point, an enzyme arose that could copy the RNA, the DNA. So there was probably first an RNA-dependent RNA polymerase that copied those RNAs, and a single base change, a single amino acid change would probably be enough to make it make DNA from an RNA template. So it's the bridge between the old RNA world and the modern DNA world. And we find reverse transcriptase in other viruses besides retroviruses, hepatitis B viruses, which we'll see today a little bit, and the colimoviridae. Yeah, those are viruses that infect cauliflower and have reverse transcriptase activity. But even beyond that, cells have other activities that resemble reverse transcriptase. So here's a, a circular phylogenetic tree of all the reverse transcriptase-like sequences that we know of. There are virus and virus-like ones. There are bacterial, there are uh, eukaryotic ones. Bacteria and archaea, sorry, they're both here. Here are the eukaryotic. And then in our cells, there are our telomerases, the ends of our chromosomes. They have RT associated with them. And so do line elements, long interspersed nuclear elements. These are highly repeated sequences in our genome that arise via reverse transcription. We'll take a look at that in a moment. So I, this is why I love this lecture because this stuff is everywhere. It impacts you in incredible ways, which we'll see a little bit about today. So the polymerases that we looked at earlier, the four classes, DNA dependent, DNA, DNA dependent, RNA, RNA dependent, DNA, which we're looking at today, and RNA, RNA, they're all shown here. They're all right hands with a palm as the active domain, fingers and thumb domains. Here's the reverse transcriptase of HIV-1, and it has an active domain. It has two metal, uh, two magnesiums uh, that are required for activity. They're coordinated by amino acid. And again, you see here at the active site, two aspartates are coordinating those two magnesium ions. The, there's another activity of reverse transcriptase enzyme. So it's, an en it's a single enzyme. It's, it can be a monomer or a multimer, as you'll see. But besides reverse transcriptase activity, which means copying RNA to DNA, it has a second activity, which is called RNase H. This cleaves RNA, as the name says, RNase, but only when it's in duplex form, double-stranded. It can be DNA RNA or RNA RNA. When it's in duplex form, RNase H will chew it up. If it's single-stranded, it will not touch it, very specific. And what it does is makes 
endonucleolytic cleavages, right? That means cuts internally, not through the ends. If you're chewing from the ends, you know what that's called? Exonucleases, right? The endo cut inside, as you can see here. The red arrows are where they would cut between an oxygen and a phosphate joining any two bases. And it makes short oligos with a five prime phosphate. So you can see that red cut is between the O and the P and a three prime hydroxyl. And they're relatively short, but you'll see the purpose is to get rid of the RNA because once we make a DNA copy, we don't need it uh, any longer. Here's HIV reverse transcriptase. It's three-dimensional structure. This is composed of two subunits. We have a P66 and a P51, and in the middle, both have come together to form the active enzyme. The, um, you can see labeled fingers and thumb and palm domain. There's the active site of the enzyme and a, it's shown with a DNA-RNA hybrid coming out of the active site. So the active site is up here in the palm domain. The RNA comes in one end, it's made double-stranded, and it continues through this groove, and then it encounters the RNA-SH domain, which is gonna chew up the RNA part so that only a single-stranded DNA comes out. So here's a cartoon of the enzyme showing you the palm domain here on the left, the active site, here are the two metals. So there was some confusion on the exam about the use of the term metal. And for non-RTs, magnesium is the metal, for sure. But for RTs, you can use magnesium or manganese. It doesn't work as well with manganese. The physiologically relevant metal is magnesium. But that's why this says metal. They're typically divalent cations, right? So there are two metal binding sites here in the RT active site and here in the RNA-H active site. So the RNA is coming in, it's made double strand, it's made into DNA in the active site, so now you have a DNA-RNA hybrid, and then as it passes through the RNA-H active site, the RNA uh, is degraded. So this is a pretty slow process. It takes about four hours to copy the nine KB genome of uh, retroviruses. So four hours is a long time and it's also error prone. The enzyme makes one error per 10,000 to a million bases. And it has no correction uh, activity, so those errors stay. So retroviruses have high mutation frequencies, which is exactly what HIV is doing. It's it diversifies incredibly in you, in a host. From your first infection, every few weeks, it undergoes antigenic change, as we'll see later, because of this high error rate. All right, so that, that's some fundamentals about RT. We'll look at the reaction in a minute, but first a question. Reverse transcriptase has revolutionized molecular biology. Which statement about the enzyme is not correct? It is unique to retroviruses. The RT is packaged in the particle. The RT has RNase H activity. The name derives from its ability to reverse the flow of genetic information, and it might have bridged the RNA world and the DNA world. You know, when, you know, the, do you know who, who coined this central dogma that DNA goes to RNA to protein? Do you know who, say, who said that? No? Francis Crick? Does that ring a bell? Watson and Crick? And then when they discovered reverse transcriptase, a reporter went to Crick and said, well, what do you think about that? And he said, I never said that. <laughs> Wasn't me. Just deny it, right? <laughs> but what he should have said was, that's the way science works. You make a hypothesis and then it may be proven wrong. And then he would at least not look slimy, right? Okay, look, we're almost at 100%. So let's see how we did. I'm not gonna wait. About 97%. Yeah, it's not unique to retroviruses, right? It's found in archaea, bacteria, and eukaryotes, and other viruses. All the other statements are correct. Uh, someone picked the name of the enzyme correct. It comes from its ability to reverse the flow of genetic information. That's actually on one of the slides, so that is correct. All right, let's take a look at reverse transcription, the process. 
So as I said, in the virus particle, the retrovirus particle, there are always two copies of the genome. So we call it diploid, not we. I'm not part of that because I don't think it's such a good name, but it's called diploid for that reason. You know, usually we associate diploid with chromosomes. These are not chromosomes. So, but that's what you'll hear. Two copies of the genome. And there are the two copies shown as a schematic on the left, panel A. Five prime end is cap, three prime end is polyadenylated. Then the coding regions for gag, pol, and envelope are there. Um, and then um, these two molecules are attached by what we call a kissing loop. And the, the, the very five prime end region uh, is highly structured as you see here. And one of these loops, SL1, can base pair with the same loop on the second molecule. So that keeps them together. You can also see in this structure in red, the PBS. Uh, it's not public broadcasting company, it's primer binding site. Because bound to each molecule of RNA is a tRNA, which is gonna be the primer for reverse transcription. This is a cellular molecule that is incorporated into the retroviral particle. So there are two molecules of tRNA that are complementary to a specific sequence in the viral genome. There are about 50 to 100 molecules of RT for, for virus particles. So I just want you to remember, I'm gonna show you now a scheme where the enzyme is cop a single enzyme is copying the genome, but there are probably multiple on there. Now, you may ask, why are there two RNAs? And we think it's to make the virus resistant to mutation because this, this genome has a high mutation frequency. And if you just had one RNA in the particle, it might be that it had lethal mutations in it. But if you have two, your chance of rescuing that mutation is better. And we, we say that it, it allows copy choice during reverse transcription to repair errors. So here we have two genomes, uh, the top green one and the bottom green one. And say there's a mutation in, on the left side here, little a that's red. There's a lethal mutation there. But during reverse transcriptase, transcription, the enzyme actually flicks back and forth very, very quickly between the two strands, just randomly. And so there might be a chance that it would copy the wild type A and, and not have that mutation. So that's the idea for having two RNAs in the particles so that you can get around this high mutation frequency. Here's the primer binding to the viral genome. So at the top of the two genomes, full length, and then we expand the very five prime end in the middle there. You can see the five prime cap, and there is the primer binding site, and there's a tRNA bound. And then below here is a more detailed view of what's going on. So here is the RNA itself, the viral RNA with the primer binding site. Here's the tRNA. And on the right, it shows you how the tRNA bases are complementary to that of the primer binding site. So this is all highly structured, as you can see, and the tRNA is fitting into that. But that three prime end is going to be the primer for reverse transcription. Again, that's a tRNA from the cell. So let's go through reverse transcription. This is an amazing process, in my opinion. And uh, you, you learn a lot from it. So I, that's why I like you to understand it. So the virus, remember, binds the receptor. Gets, somehow the nucleocapsid is, is in the cell, either at the surface or maybe from within an endosome. Uh, and then the RNA is converted to DNA. So what happens first is we have this RNA uh, in the particle in the cell. with a, And we're going to just look at one for simplicity. There's a tRNA bound to it. <clears throat> and the reverse transcriptase begins to make DNA using the three prime hydroxyl. And you can see uh, there on the second panel, you have blue DNA. It's actually the wrong color because the RNA is plus stranded. So the DNA should be light blue because plus, plus DNA is dark blue. I see this every year, but the, the book only gets revised every <laughs> six years, and so these figures are all from the textbook. Okay, uh, so that you make that little bit of DNA and then you stop because that's the end. Look, it's the end of the genome. Five prime end right there, we can't go any further. So this DNA 
is made. And at the same time, the RNA is chewed up. That's what all these little blocks mean. It means that the uh, RNA is chewed up and, and those pieces come off. So you end up with a single piece of DNA. Now what happens? So the polymerase is gonna jump from here to here, from the very five prime end of the template to the three prime end. The reason it can do so is because there's complementarity. So at the either end of the RNA, there are some repeated sequences. We have U3R, U3, little u3 and little r, and then at the other hand, you have little r and little u5. Now, when you copy them, you get big r and big u5. That signifies it's the complementary base, all right? So now, the big r can base pair with the little r, and you form a duplex, and so the enzyme simply keeps copying around that RNA, so it's jumping from one strand to another. So we call that a template jump because it goes from the five prime end of the RNA to the three prime end. Why this happens, you'll see in a bit once we get through this. So here's that step, the R, big R, little r annealing, that's the first template exchange. The enzyme continues to copy the viral RNA. You can see that in the second panel and in the third panel, it goes around. Now, what happens also is that there's a piece of RNA left behind. RNASH doesn't cut it. It's probably structured in some way. It's called PPT, polypurine tract. And that's gonna be the primer for the second strand of DNA. So before this first strand is even done, the enzyme starts to make the second strand of DNA. Obviously, it's gotta be a different enzyme. Can't be the same one, because that enzyme's working down here, right? So now we have a little bit of the other strand and almost the complete copy of the first strand. And eventually the enzyme copies all the way around the RNA and then it can't go any further. The other strand primed by PPT goes to the tRNA. The tRNA is removed endolytically, endonucleolytically by RNASH so that's no longer needed. And now there is complementarity between that light blue and the dark blue strands because both have a PBS, a primer binding site, right? Which is what the tRNA was bound to. So the first strand copied the PBS from the RNA and the second strand is copying it from the tRNA, All right? So here you see the first strand copies the PBS from the green, that's the RNA. And the, the next strand, the complementary strand is copying it from the tRNA. Remember that. It copies it once from the genome, once from the tRNA. If you, if you can remember that, write it down. Racaniello said to remember this, okay? It will come back to please you. All right, so now we have the two strands annealed here, and as you can guess, then the polymerase is gonna use that, that complementary strand to finish off the duplex. So here we have where we just left off, we have the annealing and that strand is, the second strand is completed. So now we have a fully double stranded copy of the viral RNA at the bottom there. And we have made at each end an LTR. The RNA doesn't have an LTR in it, but now we've made one. Let me show you that on the next slide. So the RNA, an LTR consists of the repeated sequences, big U3, big R, big U5. Big U3, big R, big U5. So that's a <clears throat> long terminal repeat. It's at the end, it's long, and it's repeated. It's the same sequence. But look at the RNA. It doesn't have all three segments. It's got U3 and R, or R and U5. So the jumping, the two template exchanges, what they do is make an LTR. If you go back and look at it, you will see that. Because as you copy, so from here you get U5, R, and then U3 as DNA, you've now made one LTR, and you do the same thing at the other end. So that's why we need to have these jumps to make an LTR, because when you do transcription, the LTR is lost because the transcription initiates within the LTR. Anyway, if, <clears throat> if you wanna look at an animation that I made, that kind of puts this in an animated fashion that may help you visualize it. Okay, second question. Which of the following steps occur during reverse transcription of retroviral genomic RNA? Priming of minus DNA synthesis by tRNA, two template exchanges, degradation of the viral RNA by RNA-SH, generation of two LTRs, all of the above. 
Okay, how did we do here? Is this a hundred? This could be a hundred. Number two, keep score. We'll see how many you get. So, so here is what we ended up with, a double-stranded DNA with LTRs at either end. Now that has to integrate into the host cell DNA. And that's what we're gonna talk about now because what happens is that DNA integrates in host DNA, which is shown purple here. And then you end up with a provirus, which is the viral DNA, which you can see in blue. The, the LTRs are in green. And then on either side is host DNA. And from there, the DNA is transcribed by host cell PAL2, RNA-dependent, uh, DNA-dependent RNA polymerase 2. And you get a message capped and polyadenylated. This full-length transcript is also going to be the viral genome. That's what's packaged into particles. But it also undergoes some splicing, uh, as we'll see later. But what happens here during integration? Two things that are hallmarks of inter integration by the retroviral enzyme integrase. First, you lose a couple of bases at the end of the LTR. So here you see we have AATG. Now we've lost two bases upon integration, also two bases at the other end. And we have duplicated host DNA sequence at either end. That's shown in the, uh, the red tinted areas. So you can look at a sequence in a eukaryotic genome if you see these features, you can pretty be, much be sure that it's an integrated uh, retroviral genome, it's a provirus. So let's see how that happens. So in general, the overview is we've made, remember the capsid, nucleic capsid enters the cytoplasm, it is permeabilized, and you need to permeabilize it so the NTPs can get in. Otherwise, if you have a, a, a solid capsid, NTPs will not get into that. And then reverse transcriptase makes a DNA copy, which double-stranded DNA copy, which you see there. There's also a molecule of integrase bound to the DNA, and that's shown here. Uh, it is a tetramer, so we have one, two, three, four subunits there. Now, this, this complex enters the nucleus. It's relatively small. It's not, drawn to, it's not drawn to scale here. So it's relatively small with respect to the nuclear pore. It can get into the nucleus and then it integrates into chromatin. So here's our DNA, chromatinized, wrapped around nucleosomes. And we think there are some interactions between integrase and some cell proteins. Here's one called BRD, bromo domain containing protein, which itself binds acetylated lysines, which are on the histones. And that somehow directs the integrase to the chromosome, to the chromatin for integration. So again, this tan molecule here is integrase and it's a tetramer, four copies of the same enzyme. And then uh, this is a, a description of the integration reaction. So here is integrase in tan, again, a tetramer. You have retroviral DNA with its intact ends so far. And then target DNA also binds the integrase. That's our cellular DNA in purple. The integrase removes two bases from the ends of each viral DNA. So you need to do that in order to expose uh, the, the hydroxyl, which then attacks the cellular DNA and cuts it and is ligated to it, all driven by the integrase. So now you have the ends of the viral DNA joined to host DNA. So the host DNA is also nicked and ligated to the viral DNA. Uh, then um, this molecules, the same one in these two pictures, we've removed the integrase, is repaired. Because now we have some gaps here and that's repaired by host proteins. And that's why you get a repeat at each end because initially when you, uh, when you chop each single strand of the host DNA, you now have this single strand here and a single strand on the other end and those have to be repaired. So they're filled in, those gaps are filled in by repair proteins, and that's why you have a duplication of host DNA at either end. Now you have an integrated viral DNA or a provirus. On this table on the left here is a quantification of integration sites in cells uh, for different viruses. So it's, it's shown as percent integration, and here's, these are three different retroviruses, ASLV, MLV, and HIV. 
And if you integrated randomly 26% of the time, you know, taking into account the size of the viral genome and the size of the chromosome, if you integrated randomly, you would expect 26% integration into genes and 5% into transcription start sites. But you see, these viruses don't approach the random number. They're all higher. HIV is, is very high within genes. And, there, and two of these are also higher uh, than, than random at transcription start sites. So it, it is not random, the integration, but it can happen everywhere on every chromosome, but it happens to be in specific sites, in genes or at transcription start sites. So here's a summary of what we have. We made a double-stranded DNA. It's produced by two, from two RNAs. So from two RNAs, you make one double-stranded DNA. So you're going, again, from two to one. You make a strong promoter in the LTR. We're gonna see that. Actually, did I point it out to you? Uh, so the, the promoter for mRNA synthesis is within the LTR and the terminator is in the other LTR. And you can see that transcription initiates about halfway through the LTR and it ends halfway through the other LTR. So that's why the RNA doesn't have the whole LTR because it's not transcribed. That's why it has to be rebuilt during reverse transcription. So you have a strong promoter, the LTR, built during reverse transcriptase. It's a very important fact that the LTRs have a strong, they both have a strong promoter and a strong terminator. Right, so for example, if this, if this provirus integrates next to some crucial gene, it could turn it on with that strong promoter on the right. And that happens. When we use retroviruses for gene therapy, initially we caused cancer because they were integrating next to an oncogene. We'll talk about that later. The proviral DNA then is transcribed to make viral mRNAs. They go out into the cytoplasm and are translated to make proteins. And then some of those mRNAs end up in new virus particles because they're the genome. So if you think about this, you know, we've talked about viral RNA replication by RNA polymerases. We've talked about viral DNA replication by either cell or viral DNA polymerases, where you take one genome and you copy it many times by an enzyme. It's not happening here, right? There's really no DNA replication happening. Well, when you divide, when the cell divides, the provirus will divide, so it will go to the next cell. But you're not making a lot of copies of DNA. And there's no viral RNA replication, there's transcription. So it's a very unique replication cycle in that it's all dependent on cell processes, not viral enzymes to make more of its genome with the exception of RT, but it's not really um, replication. So that, that's all summarized here. The viral RNA is copied to DNA in the cytosol. It comes in the nucleus. It integrates into the host cell, transcribed to make mRNAs, which then go on to make new particles. Now, this step of integrating into the host DNA has enormous consequences. All of you have tens of thousands, 11% of your genome is integrated proviruses. Every one of you, I, I guarantee every one of you, and you're all very similar in that, that sense. Me too, okay, I'm not making an exception for me. We all have integrated retroviral DNAs and it has very big consequences the, of which are just beginning to be sorted out. So the, the, and the reason is because once that provirus is there, it's never gonna go, it never leaves. And so if it's an epithelial cell, you know, eventually epithelial cells die, so it's gone. CD4 positive T lymphocytes, which are uh, endogenized by, which are where the HIV um, genome integrates, those eventually die as well. Although if they, they become memory cells, they can live forever. But if the genome integrates into germ cells, then you pass it on to your offspring. And when you integrate into the germline, we call those endogenous <coughs> retroviruses. So the endogenous is a special term that means the viral DNA is now part of the germline. So you pass it on to your offspring. And as a consequence, the genomes of every living thing are full of proviruses from previous infections. 
Not every virus infects the germline. HIV, for example, does not infect germ cells. It only infects CD4 positive lymphocytes. It's a good thing it doesn't endogenize. It could be even worse of a problem. Um, could you imagine if you, you have HIV and you have kids and then they all have HIV as well without any risk factors? So fortunately, HIV does not integrate, but many viruses do and we have them in me. And so what happens is many, many hundreds of thousands of years ago, you know, one person may be endogenized by a retroviral infection. And then over thousands of years, that person has offspring. So that's the red person here. And there are more and more of those as well. And sometimes these proviruses make infectious virus, but typically if they're integrated into an organism and they don't have a function, mutations arise because they're not needed and that inactivates the virus producing part of the provirus. And so many of these have become fixed in the human population. They're in all of us. Every human on the planet has certain kinds of endogenous retroviruses. Sometimes they're lost as well. So they're gained and lost. And as far as I know, you know, we haven't had any new retroviral infections in Homo sapiens for many, many, many years, probably many tens of thousands of years um, that we know of. Now we sequence human genomes and we look at them. We don't see anything except the ones that everyone has. Now, this whole process of endogenization, which is illustrated here where you have a founder who gets the provirus and passes it on to offspring. Obviously this happened, this takes many, many years to propagate, right? That, tens of thousands of years. That process is happening in real time in koalas right now. Right? You can study it in Australia. So the koalas uh, are being endogenized by a retrovirus that they got from rodents. The koalas are native to Australia, and some thousands of years ago, a retrovirus from a rodent infected a koala, became endogenized, and now the, that koala passed it on to their offspring, and they passed it on and on and on, and we can see this happening. In this figure, these are pie charts of different koala populations in different parts of Australia. So you can see uh, the, um, the populations in the north are all endogenized with this virus. You can see 250 out of 250 animals that were sampled, all endogenized. But then as you move further south, less and less. So the implication is the virus is somehow moving north to south, perhaps by movement of, of koalas. And then of course, there's some island populations like Snake Island, French Island, Phillip Island, kangaroo, uh, where it's, it's slower because yeah, I, I don't know if koalas are good swimmers, right? <laughs> or maybe they float on a piece of wood, and, uh, but, eventually, but it's getting there. And some of these islands, since I made this picture, have since been 100% endogenized. Now this virus immunosuppresses the koalas and it makes them get chlamydial infections. So chlamydia, bacterial infections that are problematic and it's causing a loss in the population of koalas. So people are thinking about immunizing the, the koalas against a chlamydial infection. Uh, if, if you look in zoos, so the only koalas elsewhere are in zoos. And there are some populations that are free of this uh, core V, it's koala retrovirus. And those are bred preferentially, obviously, because those can stay uh, retrovirus. But it's an example of endogenization uh, in real time. Now, we also, th these endogenous retroviruses are part of a family of, of elements that we call retro elements. They're sequences that move around the genome of the host by reverse transcription. So here's an example on the right here. You have one of these retro elements. It's shown here in red. It's transcribed from our DNA to make mRNA. Then it's reverse transcribed because our cells have RT in them, mostly from retro elements. And that copies the RNA into DNA, which then integrates somewhere else. So you can have, they're called transposons, retro transposons, because they move around the genome by reverse transcription. So some of these are endogenous retroviruses, but others are not endogenous retroviruses. They're elements that just move around the genome by reverse transcription. 
So they're retro elements. And we think retro elements predated retroviruses. They were in the genome long before retroviruses. They don't have a envelope gene. And as soon as they acquired an envelope, then they became retroviruses. So probably retroviruses originated from cells that had retro elements. And 42% of our DNA encodes mobile elements, including these retro elements, 42%. So here are the retro elements in the human genome, 42% of the genome, about 2 million copies of these elements. And they are divided into non-LTRs. They don't have LTRs, different classes, lines and signs, and then LTR containing, which include the endogenous retroviruses and others like retrotransposons. They're not derived from a retrovirus infection. They've always been in our genome. I want you to remember that. So the retroviruses came from retrotransposons. And the retrotransposons have been there for eons. And when they acquired a envelope, they became a retrovirus. So here are the different classes on the left. We have endogenous retroviruses. Those originated by an infection with a retrovirus. So we have LTR, the retroviral genome, LTR, duplicated sequence at either end. So these were from an infection. So our ERVs, these are abbreviated ERVs, endogenous retroviruses, they don't produce infectious particles. They make particles. If you do take some cells and look by EM, you can see retroviral particles, but they're not infectious because they've all been mutated so that they're no longer infectious. And we have retrotransposons where we have, again, LTRs, gag pole, but no envelopes. So they can't make infectious particles. They can make a particle because gag itself will make the nuclear capsid, but they will not make particles that can go from cell to cell and infect another. I don't know if any of you are interested in neuroscience, but there's a protein called ARC in the CNS, which is a retrotransposon. It makes a particle and it's thought to do neurotransmission via these particles from synapse to synapse. So it's, it's, it's really interesting, it's amazing. So those are retrotransposons. Then we have lines, which are the non-LTRs now. There's no LTRs in them, but um, there is duplicated host DNA, so it's some kind of integration process. Uh, these contain reverse transcriptase encoded, so they move by reverse transcriptase. But then there are two other elements, signs, short interspersed nuclear elements, and processed pseudogenes. These are just mRNAs, which from the previous uh, slide here, have been copied the DNA and integrated. So they don't have LTRs. They're made from an mRNA copied by reverse transcriptase and integrased from some other element that's integrating them. And that's why you have the, the duplicated sequence at either end. But they do not encode um, reverse transcriptase. So again, the retrotransposons are the ancestors of retroviruses. And less than 0.05% of these uh, elements are active in our genome, which means they're being transcribed. So we're full of these things. It's quite amazing. There is an amazing story about one of the genes in these endogenous retroviruses that's used by humans on a daily basis, and that is a protein called syncytion. Uh, syncytion is an essential pro protein for making the outer layer of cells in the placenta. It's formed by a single layer of fused cells. These are all syncytia, right? Fused cells with many nuclei and one long tube of cytoplasm. And that makes the maternal fetal barrier, right? It's, there's fetal blood there, there's maternal blood, and the syncytia trophoblasts are an essential part of that barrier. The reason they fuse is because they have a protein called syncytion, which is derived from the envelope protein of an endogenous retrovirus. So remember, when retroviruses uh, bind to cells, they have an envelope protein that binds a receptor, and then the membrane of the virus fuses with that of the cell. It's catalyzed by the glycoprotein. It's a fusion protein. So the gene encoding that, it's called envelope, has been taken from the endogenous retrovirus and put somewhere else in the genome, and there it gave rise to the placenta. This happened millions of years ago. It happened three different times in mammalian evolution. Mammals have placentas, right? 
But there are some older uh, mammals that do not have placentas like marsupials and before them. Capture of syncytion three times has led to the uh, development of a placenta in uh, all of these species. So you can see syncytion two here gave rise to placentas in many of all of these species. I just noticed this, old word monkeys. They use ancient English. You know? <laughs> and then another in integration gave rise to gibbons, orangutans, gorilla chimps, and humans. So it's a, it's a gene taken from an endogenous retrovirus. So this probably happens a lot, and this is the best studied uh, example. So this is why we give live birth as humans, because we have a placenta, the baby can develop in utero for months, and then come out quite well developed, as opposed to laying an egg, right? Can you, th I mean, without viruses, you'd all be laying eggs. Just think of it. And not, not only that, they would be, um, they would be white eggs. As you know, uh, chickens can have different colored eggs. And if you like blue eggs, you can find them at markets. You don't find them at Whole Foods or Trader Joe's, but you can find them in markets. They're blue because of a retrovirus that's integrated next to a pigment gene that makes the eggs red, uh, green, uh, blue, sorry. <laughs> so a retrovirus makes chicken egg shells blue. So without viruses, humans would be laying eggs and they'd be white. Uh, you don't think that's funny at all? <laughs> Nothing? <laughs> There's, there are also other uh, uses for these uh, retro elements. Um, so HERV-K is one of these endogenous retroviruses in all of us that infected our ancestors 200,000 years ago. So here is a kind of map of, of human development. Here's Homo sapiens here, and this is 200,000 years ago. And so here are some of our ancestors. So, you know, about 200,000 years ago, uh, our ancestors were infected with HERV-K, human endogenous retrovirus K, and that is now in all of us. We all have HERV-Ks in us. They don't make infectious virus, but during human embryogenesis, HERV-K mRNAs are made, and they persist through uh, the epiblast stage. So we have oocytes, zygotes, two, four, eight cell morulas, and then they stop after the blastocyst stage. And these, uh, RNAs, these endogenous retroviral RNAs, seem to induce immune responses in the developing embryo. So they may be part of an uh, antiviral defense system. This is just one example of many different uses for endogenous retroviruses that people are discovering. So, I, you know, I put these lectures on YouTube and I get emails every year. I said, okay, to eat the blue eggs or am I going to get a retrovirus infection? Mm -hmm. All right, the last question. Which of the following statements about retro elements is not correct? <laughs> There are many copies in eukaryotic genomes. They are currently entering the koala gene germline. Those in the human genome produce infectious viruses. They can be beneficial, none of the above. What do we have here? Most of you got uh, the right answer. Those in the human genome produce infectious viruses is not correct. They're all inactivated. Um, and, and I think probably one person wrote all, none of the above. So that's the one that is incorrect. They're all inactivated. So I wanna talk just briefly about hepadenoviruses. These are DNA viruses that encode reverse transcriptase. So the retroviruses have RNA genomes, right? They're RNA viruses, but hepadenoviruses have DNA genomes, but they encode reverse transcriptase. So what's going on there? Let's have a look. So these are envelope viruses called big cause of hepatitis and liver cancer globally. Very, very serious. You know, if you're working in healthcare, you should absolutely be vaccinated against hep B. Most kids now are vaccinated shortly after birth because it's preventable infection. The uh, virus is enveloped with uh, glycoproteins in the envelope and inside is an icosahedral capsid that contains partially double-stranded DNA. Remember, this is group seven of Baltimore. It's got a big gap of single-stranded DNA. It's got a piece of RNA. It's got a protein attached to it. We're gonna learn today why it looks like this. And I'll give you a hint. The, the protein is reverse transcriptase. 
it's stuck there because it didn't finish its job, basically. It didn't finish making uh, the second strand. So these viruses infect cells by binding to receptors. The caps, the diffusion occurs at the plasma membrane. The capsid, which contains the gap DNA, gets in the cell, docks onto the nuclear pore. The DNA then ends up in the nucleus. So the nuclear machinery repairs it because it has all these features that are not liked by the cell nucleus. So the DNA is made double-stranded. The protein is taken off and the RNA is taken off. Now it is a closed circular, covalently closed circular DNA because it was originally not covalently closed, right? It was circular, but it had a gap. Now it's fully double-stranded, covalently closed circular, and then it becomes chromatinized by the host cell. It's coated with histones, and then it can be transcribed to make mRNAs that encode for proteins to make new virus particles. And so what I want to point out here, you don't need to worry about all of this procedure, but early on, the, G, the mRNA comes into the cytosol and uh, makes structural proteins that give rise to a new capsid. And so initially a capsid is made containing the mRNA for the whole genome. There's a single mRNA that covers the whole genome. That is encapsidated into this icosahedral shell. Then reverse transcription begins because there's a molecule of RT attached to the RNA begins to reverse transcribe right in the cell before leaving. So the retroviruses are different. They reverse transcribe when they get into a new cell. This one can't wait, starts the RT before it leaves, but because the capsid is closed, it runs out of NTPs, DNTPs. So it leaves a partially double-stranded molecule. That's why it's like that, because it's so excited to get going can't wait to the next cell. If it were in the next cell, it would come apart and the NTPs could get in and make a double-stranded molecule. But it apparently doesn't matter because the cell fixes it on the next cycle. So that's the key here. RT commences in the cytoplasm. That's why you have uh, a gap in the DNA. The RNA, as you'll see, is a leftover primer, kind of like with the retroviruses. And the protein is the reverse transcriptase. So this reverse transcription part of the reproduction cycle of this virus only happens in the host cell. So here's a diagram of the reverse transcription process. I'm not gonna go into it as, in as much detail as we did for, for RNA tumor viruses, but I just wanna show you what the product is uh, at the end. So top left, and there are some elements that are very similar as you will see. So here's the viral RNA. That is what's packaged in the newly assembled particles in the cytoplasm of an infected cell. So we have a cap, we have some DRs, those are direct repeat sequences. You can see both at the three prime end. We have a poly A at the three prime end. And then here there's a stem loop that is bound to a molecule of reverse transcriptase. It's actually bound to a TP, a terminal protein, and there's RT in tan behind it. The RT, when this RNA is packaged into the capsid in the cell, begins copying this stem loop, and then it jumps to the three prime end of the RNA. So there's a template switch, very much like happens in retroviruses, and then it, the RT continues to make the DNA uh, on that strand. Uh, and eventually, you make an entire strand of of DNA and the reverse transcriptase remains stuck on one end. And this little piece of RNA uh, near the cap, that remains and acts as a primer for the second strand. Uh, but the, the, the RNA primer actually jumps from DR1 to the other strand and begins reverse transcription in the dark blue. And then it continues around using the, the three prime end as a template and that's about as far as it gets. So there are a couple of template jumps here, as you can see, there's one at the very beginning, and then there's uh, one here and a second one here. So this is where we are. We have a full length minus strand from the five prime end to the three prime end, and then the second strand has begun using 
this RNA primer that was not removed by RNASH, and everything else is removed by RNASH except this, kind of like the PPT, and that primed the second strand, but it ran out of triphosphates about right here. <laughs> and that's what's incorporated into the particle. Partially double-stranded, a lot of single-stranded here, and there's a uh, molecule of RT attached, and the primer is still there. And that primer actually has a five prime cap, which we haven't showed anywhere. So that funny genome structure is a consequence of reverse transcription happening before the virus leaves the cell, where it's a closed capsid and it runs out of triphosphates. But as I said, it doesn't matter because this is all repaired in the next cell. So here's an overview of, of what we've talked a bit about today and a little more. So we talked a lot about retroviruses where the viruses have an RNA genome. So yellow boxes are what's in the virus particle. In other words, what's the viral genome? So for retroviruses, the genome is RNA. Most retroviruses, as you'll see, there's always uh, an exception. There are some retroviruses called foamy retroviruses, uh, which package DNA in their particles for the a similar reason as the hepatitis B viruses do. They package RNA initially, uh, and then it is reverse transcribed in the particle before it leaves the cell. So some retroviruses, one class called foamy retroviruses package DNA. Then we have the hepatitis B viruses, which have an, a DNA genome, although they, they initially package RNA, it's reverse transcribed right in the particle to make that DNA. And then we also have colimoviruses. These are reverse transcriptase encoding viruses that infect cauliflower. So probably next time you eat cauliflower, you are eating some, can't really avoid them, but don't worry, it's just gonna pass through. Just passing through, nothing to see. <laughs> and these viruses have a DNA genome, although uh, they make an RNA in the cell that is reverse transcribed. You can see there's a tRNA primer hybridizing to it. It's reverse transcribed uh, in the particle, and that ends up as, as DNA. With some um, break, so it has breaks in it, as you can see, it has pieces of RNA attached. So this also has to be repaired when it gets into uh, the next cell. And so that's repaired in the cell and goes on. So obviously there's some evolutionary things going on here where Reverse transcriptase encoding viruses can have either RNA or DNA in their particle, and either one is evolutionarily successful. Now the retroviruses, of course, uh, there are a couple that infect humans, one of which is HIV-1 and 2, and we'll talk about that uh, later on because those uh, obviously are, are serious infections. But we're gonna start ending the first half of this course, two more lectures until we get to the second half, and we're going to talk about how to put virus particles together.